Okay, so the Oxford study was undertaken jointly uh, between City Council Heritage Team and Oxford Archaeology, and it sought to provide a, a broad overview of what's been dug up in Oxford over the years and to try and quantify what's been excavated through develop, development led archaeology since PPT 16. But the crux of the, the study is really a whole series of case studies looking at sites that are not scheduled but have been assessed as nationally significant, uh, sites that are more marginal and sites or assets that have now been excavated and it's possible to look back and review what we might think about the process. So what I'm going to do is essentially look at three different sites, meet each of those criteria and then provide a few basic observations. Oh, okay. okay, so to quickly provide some context for Oxford, like many many towns and cities around the country, Oxford is expanding, it's got huge population pressures, housing issues, it's going outwards, it's infilling. But arguably that's not the main dynamic that's affecting the the below ground remains in the city. Um, you may understand Oxford University is made up of uh, 38 separate colleges. Now 36 of those colleges are financially independent to the tune of the collective endowments about £3.5 billion as of 2014. And these colleges, to some extent, experience inter college competition through something called the Norrington Table. But as a university, of course, it's competing at an international level and wants to offer high, high grade facilities uh, for its students. So it's since the turn of the century, it's been a steady process of upgrading kitchens, of building music rooms, of lecture theatres, occasional wine cellar. <laughs> and this process is also sort of squeezed by the semi listed buildings in Oxford, semi grade one buildings, the very strong pressure to build down. So, the first slide is showing the pattern of basement, consented basements uh, since 2000. So, the big blob to the north is the university centrepiece development at the Radcliffe Observatory Quarter, uh, faculty development. Big blob to the south is the Westgate Centre, which we're going to talk about. Just to point out, pattern in the east end of the city. So this is where, in the 13th century, the endowed colleges start to establish, not just there, but possibly largely there. Um, in the process, fossilising huge chunks of the Lake Saxon town and medieval city in their courts and gardens. And you've got an incremental pattern <coughs> in place. So what in Oxford is, is scheduled. So you have a very large prehistoric landscape in Port Meadow, which is protected. But in terms of the historic town, as you can see, it's very linear. You have the, the 13th century town wall that sticks up above ground. Uh, you have the Norman Causeway under the route of Abington Road, bits of the castle precinct, some of the abbey precincts to the west of the town. But it doesn't take much imagination to think about a whole range of assets um, mm -hmm. beyond those protected assets that might be nationally important. There's a 12th century royal palace, Bremont Palace. There might be a Jewish cemetery outside each gate. There's an outer possible outer 13th century medieval wall, throw precincts, etc, etc. Of course, beyond that, there's the issue of the town itself. So there's Lake Saxon town, Lake, Sa Lake Saxon Burr. Uh, you've got a medieval town that 12th, 13th century, in terms of taxable wealth, is very significant in national terms. There's that declines in the 14th century. In the 13th, 14th century, the university is emerging at a European level. So a number of uh, historic England colleagues have mentioned a number of times that if you demolished all the buildings and not to been grasped it over, it would be potentially schedule. So <laughs> if we have to give great weight to each element that's impacted by development, how do you manage a very dynamic modern city? Uh, okay, so the first case study is the Westgate Centre. So this is Franciscan Ferrari, uh, just towards the south of the town. Excavated in the 60s and 70s under the direction of Tom Hassel, uh, who excavated just the north of the wall line, pretty much most the Ferrari church with its distinctive northern teaching nave and multiple chapels. At that point, Westgate was created into the south, and multi story was created in a series of um, surface car parks. Now, in 2006, the site got consent for a double basement. Um, for a new shopping centre. In 2006 and 2008, there were sequential evaluations on the site. Uh, the, the, the scheme fell through. 2014, there's a new application 
uh, a whole range of discussions with the consultant about the significance of the site. Now, the consultant's view was that the trenching had demonstrated that the walls were heavily rubbed out, and as a Ferrari, this is not a very good example, and therefore it's regionally important and not nationally important. So the counter-argument was that it's not just the friar, it's also a student general of the Franciscan order, which means that friars from across Europe came here to study high-level you know, theology and to get their academic, academic training. It's related to a whole series of people that were introductory to the key to the introduction of scientific learning, development of education, Robert Brostest, first chancellor of the university, uh, Roger Bacon, Dun Scottus, William Wacom. Uh, it's only directly comparable in the 13th century to perhaps sites in Cambridge and in Paris, and therefore a rarity argument comes in here that actually it's not just, it might be a bad example of a Franciscan Ferrari, but it's a good example of a student general. <coughs> the other argument is the survival argument, although it's heavily rubbed down, it's still possible to get the ground plan, the documentary evidence suggests that they may have two libraries, there might be interesting features to the site that, that it was getting hold of, there may be architectural detail on the ground, the evaluation found some midden deposits, some water logging, some floor surfaces. There's a possible mill site with the mill stream to the south. So ultimately, the applicant accepted national significance and they accepted substantial harm and they submitted an application that basically put forward exceptional public benefit, which was granted at planning committee. Um, so what we've got is whoop, the double basement here, John Lewis is going here. Um, <coughs> Got a, pile, a piling array over the rest of the, what remains of the friary. And there will be a big excavation taking place this summer. So if anyone's in Oxford, in fact, going and having a look, there should be a <clears throat> continuous viewing platform. <coughs> so the second case study is looking at a more marginal site. This is a site where there was a concern <clears throat> that we're starting to see a cumulative impact on street frontage deposits in the town, which are hard to de develop a deposit model for hard to quantify based on existing cellar survey information. So it's now shaped site right in the heart of the town on Queen Street in St. Aldate's. Essentially it's a mixed retail college development, a college accommodation, not on a college site but on existing retail plots. The green area is an existing basement which has been reformed. The plan was to extend the, the basement up towards the high street, taking out two plots at the top. So this is so in the central town, in the heart of the borough, but Saxon cellar pits found periodically in different areas, possibility that any given cellar might sit over Saxon layers, so that kind of stratigraphy. Uh, you're on the market, which is spread four ways from the central Carfax crossroads, tinging into the, moving into the, the Jewish quarter and Jewish owned properties. Now, it wasn't possible to get into one cellar to evaluate it, and the other cellar had been infilled, but in the 80s there had been a small excavation trench, and that had picked up oh, certainly in situ floor surface, which is interesting in itself because it's slightly out, you know, it's away from the main medieval thoroughfare. It might be a wider street, it might be a side street, it might be a marshalling area in the centre of the borough. We don't know, but there you have in situ late Saxon deposits. But unusually, it's quite a high cellar, and there's also 13th century floor levels, the street frontage deposits on the marketplace. Okay, so the debate that took place, which was a predetermination discussion, was that the regional resource assessment says that Lake Saxon deposits are nationally important urban deposits in the region. You know, this is quite a big impact on two whole tenement plots. It might kick off a paragraph in, in PPF about national importance, and that might lead to a discussion about public benefit and a given part of the scheme. So what the applicant did was to, to their credit, reduce scale of the basement to take out the main bit of the front and raise it up, preserve most of the frontage remains and have a small area of impact at the back. Documentary, documentary evidence of possible well owned by a Jewish resident in that area, but otherwise <clears throat> it will be you know, a small area of impact. So what I try to do is turn that into a, a table, that process, how would that look as a table? I'm not suggesting any sense of some kind of magic formula to, to understand these sites, but the idea is that you have one to three scoring, possible likely known, look at criteria, is there something special that we know is there? <coughs> spatial, in terms of spatial relationships, so we can get some from this side, you know, two, two plots we might do. Uh, it's a complex, you know, it's the centre of towns, multiple period deposits. And then obviously that reduces down once they, they amend the scheme. Now the hope was that 
to, to roll this out to other case studies. We haven't had a chance to do that, but it's just something to to create some discussion. <coughs> okay, so the, the third case study is the uh, Radcliffe Infirmary Burial Ground. So this is within Radcliffe Observatory Quarter Development site, a uh, big double basement proposed for uh, mass and humanities. This particular site is set aside for the Lord Athenic School of Government, which is going up. The Radcliffe Infirmary, uh, funded by 1770 established, funded by voluntary subscription, uh, linked to the teaching hospital, linked to the university. <clears throat> the people that have been put in the burial ground, which is operating between 1770 and the Burials Act 1855, but presumably people that hadn't been given parish burials, and therefore a particular subset of the population, possibly a poorer subset, nice temporal kind of small <laughs> temporal time uh, time period in terms of the, the burial uh, burial time uh, the burial use of the burial ground evaluation took place suggestion there might be hundreds of burials there reasonably good condition and a series of four uh, predetermination assessments were take, undertaken by two consultants and they they tried to bring together the data on, on burial grounds, but essentially put the argument that, one, post medical burial grounds are generally unloved and have been unloved and dug up without much recording. Two, it's not very representative of its period. There are lots of things to represent the 18th, 19th century. And three, you could look at a whole range of workhouse burial grounds and might give you the same kind of data, plus there are about 40 hospital sites elsewhere, and therefore it's at at maximum regional significance. So <clears throat> we contacted the advisory panel for burials in England. They said it's slightly hard to assess the national significance of, of the site. Uh, probably the best outcome is to focus on the, you know, the mitigation aspect. And ultimately, the, the, the view that was taken was that Although well, it may be nationally significant, we can't demonstrate it. There's no national synthesis. There's no research agenda saying these kind of sites are nationally important. It's not demonstrably equivalent to a SAM, and therefore that that line wasn't wasn't taken. So, <clears throat> 2013, there has been excavation on the site, and of 360 burials. Reasonably interesting, uh, well, re ex exceptionally good um, interest in the site good condition, uh, evidence for operation um, processes, evidence for anatomy, uh, anatomization, um, no evidence for, what, what am I looking for when they, they take body parts away? Amputation. What am I looking for? So, uh, Autopsy, okay, so autopsy, there's evidence for autopsy, which means they're looking at the bodies after death, but not anatomization where they're taking the anatomy away. So look, there's one or two burials they took the head off, otherwise, which other sites in Oxford have produced evidence for anatomization. In that assemblage, um, a whole series of traits are interest. So the research lab at the university is interested in doing an isotopic analysis to look at movement of local people. You've got a distinctive characteristic that is. You know, uh, ratio of males to the twice as many males to females. It's a particularly young assemblage, so it's mostly between 18 and mid 30s <clears throat> in terms of the uh, date range. Uh, some unusual metric traits on the burial ground on, on, in the burial assemblage, which might suggest that they're all you know, a uniformly Caucasian uh, population, so maybe you know, ethnic diversity can be picked up. So, all in all, lots of interesting things that. Are quite current in terms of academic research, and when the, the study was done, it's quite clear still that in retrospect, this is a, <clears throat> a nationally significant site. Now, to play devil's advocate, if this site has stayed in the ground for 40 years and 20 workhouse burial grounds been excavated and four or five other hospital burial grounds, would that interest remain the same level, or would it, would it then become a regionally significant site? And what does that mean? You know, if this of interest research it is it? definitely I'm very excited by it. Interest research is now actually the theory is we shouldn't be excavating it. So there are kind of complications to, to the process to, to tease out. Okay, so 
this is just setting out the, the, the thought process and the, the sort of filters that take place in assessing significance. On the one hand, you've got a well-defined asset type. It's kind of separate track for trying to get to grips with urban deposits. Um, just to make a few observations, in terms of the assessment process, my reading of DC, the DCMS statement is that there are a whole series of filters that you can apply to assess significance, including more ephemeral things like spirit of place and historic interest, and for other sites, they might be really central to the assessment, and not necessarily all about principles of selection. But we had a workshop after the, the project, and it seemed very clear that the designation team was very, very focused on principles, principles of selection and didn't go to those difficult areas. Now, that perhaps needs some discussion or elucidation. What's missing from this diagram is any kind of side thing saying contact English heritage, uh, that historic England. <laughs> uh, and what, what, what do they think? And that, that, what else? What, the other thing that came out from the workshop is that there seemed to be some lack of clarity about whether anybody outside the designation team could take a view on national significance. And that seemed to have happened at least one of the places in the country where they had done. And therefore, the status of that maybe needs some clarification. Uh, and if historic England do want to comment, within the, the time scale, of course there's a problem with an 8 or 13 week time scale potentially to comment on. At any point during that time scale you might get the evaluation report which gives you the decisive information. How would any you know, voluntary consultation process work unless we're prepared to keep suspending the application uh, time scales. In terms of Oxford, I mean, kind of reinventing the wheel, it ties into what's in the next talk which is about Scotland where they already have one but inevitably we suggested a register sit between local asset register and designated status, perhaps could be in a local plan or at SPD, it could be thematic in Oxford's case, you could have you know, Roman kilns we haven't found yet in the east, east of the city. Um, there are obviously problems with that which you know, would take up a, a discussion in itself. Uh, I suppose finally in terms of Oxford, the reason for getting into this project is to, to, to pitch for a more detailed truncation deposit model, to get someone out with a GPS and go and measure the basements and actually work out where the holes in the ground are in Oxford, which would help us make a more contextual decision about what might be left and what kind of street frontage deposits or back plot deposits or academic hall deposits might survive across the town and then use that in an evidence-based way to, to put the arguments. I wasn't obviously what the stock in the out the process, but I, I just mentioned it to end and I will leave it there to give you plenty of time for the next question. Bless you.